Now, as you would know, the British government, even under a Conservative Prime Minister in Boris Johnson, it's the full bottle on reducing greenhouse gas emissions and getting to net zero by 2050. It's kind of easy for them, really, isn't it? They've switched from coal to North Sea gas and they've got nuclear energy of their own and they import extra nuclear energy from France when they need it, when they have trouble with their renewable energy, which, of course, in their case, is mainly wind energy. But in the last 24 hours or so, despite all of that, the UK got caught a bit short. The wind didn't blow and demand was pretty high and Britain had more demand for electricity than supply. So guess what it did? It fired up, wait for it, it fired up a couple of old coal-fired power stations. Yep, two dirty old coal-fired power stations got them through. The trouble is that one of those stations is going to be decommissioned next year and the other a couple of years after that. And now we'll be left to wonder what source of energy will get Britain out of the doldrums then. Let's catch up with Keith Pitt, the Federal Minister for Resources and Energy. Thanks for joining us again, Keith. You must be wondering what the hell the POMs are going to do if they get stuck without enough wind in years to come. I, not just them, Chris. I mean, if Australian Labor ever wins government here, I don't know what the Australian people will do. But, I mean, the United Nations carry on yesterday. We're not some sort of vassal state. We are a sovereign nation. And the decisions on our energy network and the things that we export... Well, they're decisions for us, uh, decisions for our country and our government elected, duly elected by the Australian people. And I think the UK is just the tip of the iceberg. I'm um, hearing they're trying now to take out gas heating systems and water heaters. Uh, and once people start to get, uh, you know, cold, cold toes and fingers when they're lying around in bed, I know who they'll blame. Yeah, so you're referring to the UN, the United Nations, telling Australia to get out of the coal caper. Uh, you say uh, that uh, they shouldn't be uh, interfering in what a sovereign nation does, but all of our uh, climate and emissions commitments are UN commitments. Uh, going to Glasgow and talking about net zero, that's a UN commitment. So we invite this sort of intrusion upon ourselves, don't we? Oh, Chris, as you know, I mean, we've signed up to the 2030 agreement. Uh, we're, we're actually on track to meet and beat our targets. We're one of the few countries that have had actual emissions reductions, more than 20%. Uh, but the idea that we just keep getting punched in the face by people who are not the elected government about what we choose to do for our exports and the benefit of our economy and our people and our jobs, well, I just get a bit tired of it, to be honest. Uh, the, the, the reality is very straightforward. Uh, we, we have a number of coal-fired power stations, but nowhere near as many as China or the US or other big countries with a big population. Our exports uh, are relatively significant, uh, but they're nowhere near uh, the Chinese, uh, India, uh, even US domestic consumption, which last time I checked was somewhere between four and 500 million tonnes. Well, that's a lot of coal. Yeah, now, the, uh, the, the British example that I mentioned, look, it's just a, a one-off uh, and there's been other little examples like that, but the, they do have that extra backup there with coal, which, as you know, is not very quick and easy to fire up. They'll have to have some... That shows, though, that they need more generation, they more, need more backup, because it doesn't matter how many uh, wind turbines you put in place, uh, especially over a geographic location as small as the UK... Uh, there will be times when you go days without wind energy. Well, you, you can have 100 times more generation capacity than you need if it's intermittent. Eventually, it'll just stop. Uh, and what do you do then if your coal-fired stations are either gone or they don't work because they haven't been running for some time? And uh, you know, coming from that industry, Chris, it's just not that easy to fire these things up and expect that they'll operate after they've been sitting around cold for some weeks or months or, in fact, years. So it's just not that simple. Uh, but I think the, the people of Britain are going to send a very clear message to Boris uh, that they're not happy about those things, particularly when it's going to cost them more money. Uh, and once it directly impacts the individual, uh, well, look out the politicians. Yeah, we need to very uh, much hasten slowly on this stuff because uh, we could leave ourselves short in the long term. Now, I, I was interested in the piece you wrote on the weekend about some of this activism from businesses again, especially insurance companies and financiers, trying to basically uh, shut down their services to small businesses who are involved in the coal industry. It's this woke activism, this climate change activism through companies. Uh, how can you defend companies? How can you stop this sort of commercial, I don't know, 
how, how can we describe it? Almost commercial blackmail against companies. They're, they're penalised for being involved in this sector. Well, I think you're bang on. And I never thought I'd see the day where there wouldn't be an Australian bank not willing to back Australian coal. And it's not just thermal coal. They've rubbed out met coal as well. So, you know, no steel making for you. But the, the reality here is straightforward. Our finance will still be provided. It'll be international. I'm sure you can guess where that's likely to come from. I don't know that that's in our interest or the Australian people's interest. Uh, but the idea that insurance companies are now making decisions about what projects they will or won't insure because they might connect to a coal mine, for example. Uh, and this railway line for Adani is a prime example. It's a railway track. It doesn't stop being a railway track simply because you put coal in the carriage. Uh, the risk of the construction is exactly the same as it would be if you were carrying cattle or wheat or some other product, even people, Chris. So I, I just want to call these people out for their ideological position. Uh, and if, if they're true believers, we'll stop providing mortgages to coal mine workers uh, and start insuring things that are, are just simply commercial construction risks. Now, in terms of what we can do about it, well, I'm waiting on George Christensen and his committee to provide their recommendations, which we'll look at very closely. But there has to be a way. This is Australia's second biggest export commodity. Uh, it provides a lot of jobs into regional Australia and we want to keep them. Well, it's a form of discrimination. It's commercial discrimination. If you're doing it to a person, if you're rejecting a person on the basis they're involved in a certain industry, it'll be against the law, presumably. So you need to look at... Uh, I, mean, I hate putting the hand of government in anywhere, but there, there needs to be some sort of anti-discrimination provisions in, in our commercial law. Oh, can you imagine if they said they weren't going to provide finance for pubs uh, because they don't like alcohol uh, or people who might have a gambling house or a casino? Don't give uh, them I mean, any ideas. People would be outraged. They would be ah, indeed. They'd, they'd, well, they'd be outraged and rightly so. And now these are legitimate legal businesses in Australia going about a business that they have done for decades, in fact. Uh, it's the backbone of our economy. And there's a lot of hard-working people out there that give their heart and soul every single day for Australia and, and making sure that we keep ticking over. Uh, and Chris, yeah, this is how we pay for the essential services people rely on. How do they think we pay for hospitals and roads and education and schools? Uh, it comes from royalties from the resources sector and taxes. A lot of those taxes are paid by resource workers. Thanks for joining us, Keith. I appreciate it. Great to be with you.